If you had to build a garbage dump over one of these three places, which one would you pick? I would say one. So, one. I would pick number one. 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 Number uno. It's just visually, it looks kind of stunted, like it's just brown, and that's, that's kind of it. For the most part, it looks like lots of dead or dying plants. Its scrubby scenery is the opposite of charismatic. Rather than having rainforest envy, I take a lot of pride in my local biome, and I hope that more Southern California residents can too. I'm the head volunteer at Cabrillo National Monument for their greenhouse. This really opened my eye to all the little things that call um, our native habitat home. Something that looks like it's just kind of barren, a barren wasteland, right, is actually vibrant and filled with life. It's, it's so rich, there's so many of them. When we say chaparral, a lot of people do not know what we're talking about. And we're talking about smaller shrubs that are adapted to a Mediterranean climate. The chaparral is really unique. The animals and plants that live there are super adapted to this harsh environment. If you're ever walking along the coast of Southern California and you hear something that sounds just like a mewling newborn kitten, um, that is the California gnatcatcher. It's got a very, very distinct little call. The coast horn lizard, AKA horny toads, looks like a tiny little mini triceratops and has amazing adaptations to avoid predators like squirting blood from its eye would not exist without the uh, chaparral biome. And these climates occur only in five places in the world. And Southern California is just one little niche for these plants to thrive in. Um, we need to conserve it for the biodiversity. And we don't have that in our neighborhoods. Um, everything has disappeared. When people think nothing is happening in the scrublands, they don't feel like they need to protect it. Roads do something called habitat fragmentation, which means it takes an intact habitat and roads cut those habitats up. There's something called the edge effect, some species are really, really sensitive to interference by humans. They're sensitive to, you know, human noise, for instance. They can't live on the edges of the habitat. People don't welcome chaparral plants into their yards. Instead, they plant invasive species because they think they look nicer. Um, people have carved the lands for houses, they have put lawns that in, in, in their yards, um, they've planted a lot of non-native um, plants. The beautiful chaparral habitat gets torn down so people can build those, those houses and those roadways, and those freeways. We need we need to start to rethink um, to rethink how we how we build and we need to build cities up and and not out in the um, wild areas. So what can we do? Just having that one tree will attract birds and other things. Um, it, it's just, a, it's just a, a gift to just put one plant. You don't have to redo your whole yard or anything, but you know, put a few, a few natives um, that will help.
These plants require less care because they're already suited to the environment that you're in. At my college apartment, the landscaping wasn't designed to look like chaparral. Back home, we have an elderberry bush in our backyard. It's native to chaparral biome, and our chickens love to use it as shade. Think about, like, what is it that these plants and animals have to have to have to live here and know that they are special. Chaparral might look strange and prickly, but it's worth protecting. It's beautiful in its own way.